Um, so we're in uh, the book of Exodus, um, 10 sermons. Uh, today is part one, and in many ways it'll serve as an introduction uh, to this book, um, but at the same time will be its own individual message. Um, and what I want us to see in today's message, uh, I'm going to try to pull out as many themes as I can uh, that we find in uh, the beginning of Exodus, uh, but that we will see throughout Exodus, right? And these themes are important for us um, because in many ways they speak of who God is, uh, and then also they, they communicate to us uh, what we get wrong, how we sin, how we are disobedient. And then also it kind of helps us to uh, make our way back to the Father's heart, all right? Um, and so uh, Exodus part one, uh, I'm going to say this, uh, probably should have uh, sent an email out or, or put it on social media. Uh, if you have a Bible, all right, if you're planning to journey with us over these next uh, 10 sermons, and if you have a Bible, I'm going to encourage you every Sunday to bring it, um, because we're not going to go literally line by line. Um, Exodus is massive. Uh, we'd be in it forever, um, but I'm not against going line by line. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to take kind of chunks of Exodus and, and try to unpack it. And so we're going to be moving between verses quite a bit. Uh, but today, it'll, uh, I think I've got most of them up on the screen. But if you have a Bible, uh, I'm going to encourage you to bring it because it'll be really cool. You can make uh, markings in it. Uh, you can put your fingers in between the different pages as we like, hey, I want you to see this, but then uh, go over here. And again, just trying to paint a broad picture of what's going on here. Um, and my heart is that you would see God for who he is um, as we seek to understand who we are on this journey um, as we make our way through this book. Is that, a, is that okay? And if you don't have a Bible, uh, please come and speak to us at the end. We'd love to give you one. We'd love to gift you uh, with uh, the greatest words ever found, uh, and they're found in the scriptures. And so if you don't have one, speak to Jonah, myself, or the guys with the red lanyards, um, and we'll get you one. Everyone ready? Yeah? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much um, just for who you are. Uh, you are seated on your throne. You are fully in control. Um, and so, Lord, as we begin this new series, we uh, are asking, uh, like you've done before, uh, that you would lead uh, and that we would follow. Uh, Lord, I pray uh, that you would open up our minds so that we might understand, so that we might comprehend, uh, that all of this would make sense. Uh, and so we come to you for that. Uh, we ask uh, that you would open up our hearts so that we might be convicted by your word, because your word is truth. Your word gives life because it points us to the life giver. So, Lord, this time is yours. We want to honor you and glorify you. We pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy. Holy Spirit, would you be with us? We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Now, if I was to title our message today, I would, I would say it this way. We're seeking to answer the question, how did we get here? I think that's also a song, right? Right? Is it? How does it go? How did we... No, 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 no. So we're seeking to answer the question, how did we get here? How did they, the, the people of God, how did they get here? How, like, why is Exodus even here in our Bible? Why is it necessary for us to unpack? How did we get here? So uh, Exodus, if you were to start at chapter 1, uh, Exodus starts off by telling us that the people of God, the Israelites, were fruitful, increasing rapidly, multiplying, and becoming extremely numerous so that the land was filled with them. We see this in Exodus chapter 1, verse 6. That's how the book begins. Then we see Pharaoh oppressing the people of God through slavery and genocide, forcing mothers to kill their children. This is how the book begins. And so slavery, uh, Pharaoh does this hoping that through this the Israelites won't increase and multiply, that they won't be fruitful. We see this in verse 11 of the first chapter. So the Egyptians assigned 
taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. He did not want them to multiply. It, for, for him, it was becoming an issue. But this didn't work. Verse 12, but the more they were oppressed, or the more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. It didn't work. Plan one uh, or plan A did not work. And so he, he then goes to plan B, which is genocide. Pharaoh then tries this approach through the midwives. They were instructed to take the male babies and kill them. The Hebrew midwives didn't obey Pharaoh because they feared the Lord. Verse 19, the midwives said to Pharaoh, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. I, I, love, I love that. They are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. That's what they say to Pharaoh. It's like, man, we're trying, we're trying, but, but by the time we get there, the babies are born already. They didn't obey Pharaoh, but rather they obeyed God. And because of this, we see that God blesses the midwives. He blesses them with families which points to uh, the fact and the reality and the truth that obedience produces fruit. That's a, a theme that we're going to see throughout Exodus, that obedience produces fruit. In fact, it's a recurring theme in the Bible. All that Pharaoh tried to do didn't work. In fact, the opposite happened. The Israelites continued to multiply. And so Pharaoh gets frustrated. He gets frustrated, and so now he orders everyone, not just the midwives, right? In the beginning, it was the Hebrew midwives, but now he orders everyone to throw every son born to a Hebrew family into the Nile. Verse 22, Pharaoh then commanded all his people, you must throw every son born to the Hebrews into the Nile, but let every daughter Live. If you were wondering if Pharaoh ruled with a dictatorship hand, then there it is. There it is on full display. In fact, we continue to see this kind of rule over and over. This is when insanity takes over. He puts in a law and he says, you know what, because my plans are not working, now everyone, every citizen of Egypt, if you see this happening, you must take every son born to a Hebrew family and throw them into the Nile River. And so it's in this context we now see the main character introduced to us. It's in this brokenness that we see something miraculous happen. Moses is born. His mother, we're told, hides him for three months, but then when she could no longer do so, she places him in a basket and puts the basket in the Nile River. Moses is then found by Pharaoh's daughter. She organizes for him to be nursed and taken care of, and then when Moses got older, he was brought to Pharaoh's daughter and became her son. The text tells us that she calls him Moses because she drew him out of the water. I'm just quickly going through the story here, just wanting to get everybody on the same page. She calls him Moses because she says, I drew him out of the water. Uh, it's interesting, interesting, that it's not just the Hebrew midwives that are undermining Pharaoh's orders. I want you to see that here. It's not just Moses' biological Hebrew mother undermining Pharaoh's orders, but we see here Pharaoh's daughter undermining him. And she is an Egyptian, pointing us to something far bigger happening here in the story. There is something far bigger happening here in this Story, But anyway, Moses then grows up, chapter 2, verse 11. He one day goes out, sees an Egyptian beating one of his people, a Hebrew. And then the text tells us 
Verse 11, years later, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and observed their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian striking a Hebrew, one of his people. And, and so he checks coast. That's, that's kind of how we used to say it, right? He, he checks coast and sees what's going on. Then steps in, murders the Egyptian, and then buries him in the sand. The next day, Moses goes out again and sees two Hebrew men fighting. He tries to step in and help, but they turn on him and ask the question, verse 14, who made you a commander and judge over us? The man replied, are you planning to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And so Moses hears this. He freaks out because he realizes people know what he has done. In fact, what he did also comes to Pharaoh's knowledge. And then the text tells us that Pharaoh actually tries to kill Moses. So Moses makes a run for it. He makes a run for it. And he ends up in a place called Midian. Now, while in Midian, he uh, sees some women, uh, daughters of the priest of Midian, who we will later come to know as Jethro. But let me, let me uh, read uh, this portion of the text, right? So uh, from verse 16 of chapter 2, it says, Now the priest of Midian, um, a little history about, um, about this priest, and uh, we'll get to it uh, in a couple of weeks from now, but really, really interesting uh, that Jethro, right? Jethro uh, is actually African. My, my, my. And, and the text that we're going to, uh, to preach in a couple of weeks, I've titled it, Wisdom from Africa. Because I believe as Africans, we need to know that our story matters in our faith. That, that for too long, we've in many ways believed the lie that, that Christianity has come from the north. And when I say the north, I mean from Europe. But there is so much rich history here on our continent. There's so much wisdom. But we'll get into that in a couple of weeks from now. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then some shepherds arrived and drove them away. But Moses came to their rescue and watered their flock. When they returned to their father, Ruel, that's Jethro, his clan name, he asked, why have you come back so quickly today? They answered, an Egyptian, notice they refer to Moses as an Egyptian, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. So where is he? He asked his daughters. Why then did you leave the man behind? Invite him to eat dinner. We'll see later that Jethro loves to eat. Jethro loves to table. Verse 21. Moses agreed to stay with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. She gave birth to a son whom he named Gershom. For he said, I have been a resident alien in a foreign land. That's important. It's a theme that's going to come up several times through uh, this book. I have been a resident alien in a foreign land. The ESV says it this way, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. The uh, New Living Translation says, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to underline that. It's going to come up again, and it's got great significance for our series and for us. So let me finish this chapter, verse 23 of chapter 2. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor. They cried out, and their cry for help uh, because of the difficult labor ascended to God. God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the Israelites and God knew. End of chapter 2. Enter chapter 3. 
And chapter 3 is a portion of scripture I believe that many of us are familiar with. It's where God calls Moses through a burning bush. But before we go there, right, before we get to chapter 3, I want us to slow things down a little bit. I want us to ask a few questions. I want us to look at a few things so that we might understand what's actually going on here. I want to look at a few things. And of greatest importance, the thing at the top of the list that I want us to see is that we are told that God remembered his covenant. That's how chapter 2 ends. We're told that God remembered his covenant. He remembered his promise, a promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that this is what compels him to respond. He hears the groaning of his people and he remembers a promise and then he responds. And so let's take a look at this promise. Let's take a look at this covenant. And to do so, we need to go back all the way to Genesis chapter 12, where God makes a covenant with Abraham, where he tells him he will make him fruitful and multiply. That's what God says to Abraham in Genesis 12. Let's read it together. Genesis 12 from verses 1 to 3. The Lord said to Abram, his name later changed to Abraham, but he said to Abram, go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So God makes this covenant with Abraham. Then God confirms this covenant in Genesis 15. The story goes like this. Uh, Abraham makes a sacrifice in Genesis 14 uh, with an interesting man called Melchizedek. I wish I had time to unpack it. I uh, actually did uh, for our Good Friday service. And so if you want to know more about this man, Melchizedek, then I'd encourage you to go a- and look up that sermon. But he, he makes a sacrifice with Melchizedek. Then God appears to Abraham in chapter 15. It appears to Abraham in in a dream, in in a vision, and promises that I, this is God, will make you into a great nation and multiply your children. And then he says, but it will come in the form of suffering and oppression. Let's read this passage, Genesis 15. From verse 1, it says, After these events, this is Abraham with Melchizedek, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. Uh, Then we jump all the way to verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain. Guys, when God says, Know this for certain, it's, going to, it's, it's for certain. It's going to happen. Know this for certain. Your offspring will be resident aliens. Remember that? Your offspring will be resident aliens for 400 years in a land that does not belong to them and will be enslaved and oppressed. And so this had already been communicated. We, we, we opened up Exodus chapter 1 and 2, but, but here we see it already in Genesis 15. And so a couple of things here to take note of. One is as we open up Exodus 1, we see that prophecy is coming true. That God is faithful. That he says, know this for certain, know this for certain. We also see that Moses' son's name, Gershom, is intentional. Moses may not realize it, but it's intentional. It's not just a name for his son. It's not just an experience that he has, but, but it's, it's part of the grand narrative. Verse 22 of Exodus 2, she gave birth to a son whom he named Gershom, for he said, I have been a resident alien in a foreign land. 
God repeats the same covenant to Jacob in Genesis 46. And so he gives a covenant to Abram, and then he repeats it to Jacob in Genesis 46 with some interesting similarities to Abram. We see that in Genesis 46 that Jacob also makes a sacrifice just like Abram did. We also see that Jacob falls asleep and God comes to him in a vision or a dream in the same way that he did with Abram. So uh, let's look at the text, Genesis 46, verses 1 to 3. It says, So Jacob set out for Egypt with all his possessions. And when he came to Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. During the night, God spoke to him in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, he called. Here I am, Jacob replied. I am God, the God of your father, the voice said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make your family into a great nation. God is faithful. I will go with you down to Egypt, and I will bring you back again. You will die in Egypt, but Joseph will be with you to close your eyes. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, God says. I'm wondering why Jacob would be afraid. If you are familiar with the story, Jacob and Joseph and his sons. And, and so he's going to Egypt in many ways, going to see his long lost son. What, why, why would he be afraid? Well, I wonder if Jacob was thinking in the back of his mind, is this it? Is this the time that my grandfather Abraham spoke of, that my father Isaac spoke of, the time where we would be in a place that is not our home? And we as a people would be enslaved for 400 years. Is this the time? I said it to you, but let me say it again. Remember, Jacob is going to go see his long lost son, Joseph. He should be filled with joy. But I wonder, I wonder if in the back of his mind, he's wondering, is now the time? See, the promise of greatness is still there. It's still there. But it will come at great suffering and oppression. I mean, look, look at the promise in Genesis 15 made to Abraham. Let's take a look at it again from verse 13. It says, Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know this for certain. Your offspring will be resident aliens for 400 years in a land that does not belong to them and will be enslaved and oppressed. However, verse 14, I will judge the nation they serve, and afterward they will go out with many possessions. With many possessions. And so the promise of greatness is still there. But it will come at great suffering and oppression. Uh, can I point out something here? That this promise of being fruitful and multiplying that was given to Abram and given to Isaac and given to Jacob is, is not a new one. It's something that has always been on the mind and heart of God for his people. Genesis chapter 1, let's go all the way to the beginning. From verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful. Multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Friends, God commands this of us. He commands this of us. And so the question is why? Why would God want us to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it? Why? so that his glory would cover the earth. Remember, we are created in God's image. We are created in God's image, and so there is nothing greater than, than for, for God's image to fill the earth. And so as image bearers of God, we display God. We display God in all that we do. 
And this glorifies him. Habakkuk 2, verse 14, For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with the awareness of the glory of the Lord. And God chooses to do so through his people. It's not a new thing. The covenant that God makes with Abraham is not a new thing. We see it right at the beginning. But we also know that at the beginning, sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. And that things then spiraled into brokenness and chaos and anarchy. But friends, this did not stop God's plan to fill the earth with his glory. It only delayed it. Because we see in Genesis that, that God then begins his rescue mission. Because God is faithful. God is faithful. So we see this promise of fruitfulness and multiplication. This, this promise of having a land to fill and subdue. We, we see this promise reinstated in Abraham. But Abraham didn't see the promise fulfilled. Neither did his son Isaac. And so now Jacob in Genesis 46, I believe, is wondering, is now the time? It was given to Abraham, but, but Abraham didn't see it. And so passed on to Isaac, and Isaac didn't see it. And so Jacob is going, well, well, well is it now? Is now the time? There seems to be a lot falling into place, God. Is now the time? And so when we open up the book of Exodus, we see that it starts with massive multiplication. It starts with fruitfulness. But it's strange. You see, the people are probably going, we are fruitful in number. We are multiplying, but we are under oppression and suffering. So what's going on? What's going on, God? What are the people to hold on to? Right? They, they, they're seeing this multiplication and they're going, okay, but, but why are we suffering? God made a promise to our forefathers, but, but, but why? Why are we not flourishing? How? How are they to stay hopeful in the midst of this uncertainty? When things are not going their way, here's the answer, friends. And it's a grand theme throughout the book of Exodus. Here's how they are to remain hopeful. It's to remember that God is faithful. That God is faithful. And because he is faithful, nothing can stop the plans and purposes of God. So, some of y'all need to hear that today. Nothing. Nothing can stop the plans and purposes of of God, because he is faithful. Nothing can stop it. Not Pharaoh in uh, Exodus, not dictators or rulers, not persecution, not COVID, not crisis, not chaos. Nothing. Not even us and our sinfulness. And so if you're sitting here and you're going, you know what, I, I just don't know. I don't know if God can do what he has promised that he will do, because look at my life. It will not stop the faithfulness of God. God is still in control, and he still has a plan, even in the face of chaos and evil. I mean, look at what Joseph says to his brothers at the end of Genesis, which in many ways sets up Exodus quite well. He is speaking about how his brothers sold him into slavery, and yet God is still at work. Genesis 50, verse 20. Joseph says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He, this is God, not, not you, not your plans, not your evil, not, not, no, 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 no. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. God is still in control. And so this is how Genesis ends. The book of Genesis, it, it ends with Joseph making this declaration about who God is and his faithfulness. 
well, there's a few more verses, right? So it doesn't end at verse 20. There's a few more verses. But, but, but even in those verses, Joseph says some pretty big things. Uh, look with me in verse 24 of Genesis 50. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will certainly come to your aid and bring you up from this land to a land he swore to give to who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is faithful. He is faithful. He does not forget. I think what we do sometimes is we sit and we look to the heavens and we go, God, have you forgotten us? Have you forgotten what you said to us? No, he is faithful. God is constantly at work. While you sleep, he is at work. Behind the scenes, he is at work. And so Joseph then says this to his brothers, and then Joseph dies. Turn the page, Exodus chapter 1. The people are fruitful and increasing in number, but are under massive oppression. So they cry out. God, don't forget us. Don't forget your covenant. They cry out, God, save us. And God does. We know this because we sit on this side of the story. We know how the story ends, right? So God, God did save them. But I want to bring you into the tension of the Israelites. They didn't know this. They had no idea what was going to unfold. And so for them, after 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, they for sure were left looking to the heavens asking God, where are you? Where are you? Will you fulfill your promise? Will you honor your covenant? Will you be faithful? Will you? And the answer is yes. It's yes. See, but with God, his yes is not always the way that you think it will play out. Can we be real for a moment? I, I want to believe God. I, I know that he is faithful. But I'm left wondering, God, are you going to do it the way that I have planned? And oftentimes, it's not. It's not. If we comb through the scriptures, we see that God often fulfills his work through suffering. We can read story after story after story, book after book, chapter after chapter. God often fulfills his work through suffering, and that's the case right here. That is exactly what's happening right here. Joseph's story is one of God working all things for the good of his people through the suffering of Joseph. Oh, if I had time, I'd love to make those connections to Jesus. But we don't have time. See, Joseph is a story of a son thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, wrongfully accused, imprisoned. And yet this was the path that he took for him to be exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh. Where's Jesus right now? We don't have time. What I want you to see is that through suffering, God fulfills his promises. Through suffering, God fulfills his promises. And so in Exodus, particularly chapter 1 and 2, we see God's plan and purposes being fulfilled. However, for the Israelites, they don't see that. They don't. They don't see that. In fact, it's the opposite for them. The more they multiply, the more the oppression. But maybe, just maybe, there's a, a few mature Israelites among the people. And they're going, no, 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 no. We, we, see, we see God's promises being fulfilled. But I'm pretty sure if you were to question them, they'd go, but where's the rest of it? We, we see the multiplying. We see the fruitfulness. But where, where is the rest of it? God, we are multiplying, but where is the fruitfulness? 
God, we are being owned. When do we own our own land and rule it? God, we are expanding here in Egypt, but it's under harsh dominion, the harsh control of Pharaoh. When will we expand beyond this place in flourishing under your gracious and merciful hand? When? We see part of it, God. And so what did they do? They groaned. They groaned. The text tells us they cried out to God. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, years passed and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose up to God. You see, their suffering causes them to draw close to God. If we examine the text carefully, their suffering causes them to draw close to God. And, and so we could say that God again is using suffering for our good. Don't miss it, friends. Don't waste your suffering. God often will allow us to go through suffering so that we might cry out to him. And so don't waste it. Yes, we, we pray. We pray for the miraculous. We pray for the healing. We pray for the restoring. We pray for the reconciling. But in that moment, just ask the question, God, what are you doing with this suffering? What is it that you are teaching me in this suffering? How could I draw closer to you in this suffering? It's good for us to draw close to God. It's good for us to draw close to God. It's good for us to cry out to God in times of need. Not to run to all these other things hoping that they will give us what we need. They won't. They're like temporary band-aids. And so we run to God. And so through suffering, they are crying out to God, to the God of covenant. The one who is faithful. He was faithful with Abraham, faithful with Isaac, faithful with Jacob, faithful with Joseph. He is faithful. And so here's another theme that we'll find in our series throughout Exodus. That there is a groaning that leads us to God and a groaning that leads us to sin. And this is an important theme in the book of Exodus. It's also an important one in our lives today. As we move through Exodus and as we see the people of God groaning, we're going to have to assess, is this godly groaning or ungodly groaning? Is our groaning crying out to God because we know he is faithful? Or are we groaning because we have no hope? What are you groaning about at the moment? And is it drawing you closer to God? Or has it opened up the back door and now bitterness and unforgiveness and anger and jealousy, prejudice, racism, are they now living rent-free in your heart? Is it godly groaning or ungodly groaning? And so in all of this, in all of this, no matter how bad things get, we must remember, we here today in 2021, we must remember in the same way that we see in the text, the Israelites remembering, we must remember verses 24 and 25 of chapter 2. It says, God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the Israelites and God knew. 
See, chapter 2 ends by telling us that God was concerned about the Israelites. He was concerned about the Israelites. It tells us that God is concerned about us today. He's concerned about us here today. See, what the scripture says is that God knew his people. He knew all about them. The word suggests uh, intimate, personal knowledge with all the particulars of their sufferings. That's what the text is telling us. The God of covenant, the God who sees, the God who hears, and the God who remembers is the God who knows our situation in all its desperate need. God has not taken a bathroom break. He's not at the wheel going, what on earth is going on? He is aware of every single situation that you're experiencing. Every emotion, every thought, every desire. He is a God who is worth praying to. He already knows all about our situation because he sees everything that happens. He hears our cries, the loud ones and the silent ones. Even, hear me friends, even when they are ungodly groanings. He remembers that we belong to him by the covenant of grace in Jesus Christ. He remembers that. He remembers that we are his children. That is to say, that for those who have crossed the line of faith, to all those who have surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior, we can say, to quote Rory Dyer, we can say, in crisis, in COVID, in chaos, we can always say we are still in Christ. Because God remembers he remembers. He answers our prayers. Not always in the way that we hope. Or even in the way that we expect. But always in a way that brings him glory. And that is what we're going to see as we navigate through the book of Exodus. Over and over and over again, we're going to see a God of glory. A God who loves his people. A God who remembers his covenant. A God who calls us to obedience. Because in obedience we find fruitfulness. My hope is that we would find God throughout this series. And for some of us it might be for the very first time. Just like the Israelites were on this journey witnessing miracle after miracle after miracle. But we have not experienced the greatest miracle, which is our own transformation. But maybe for many of us, it's recognizing that our eyes need to be focused on the author and perfecter of our faith. That we cannot desire to go back to Egypt that we should not believe the lie of the evil one that God is not for our good. He answers our prayers. God answers our prayers. Not always in the way that we hope or even in the way that we expect. Let me say it in closing. I say it by way of reminder. But always in the way that brings him glory. Welcome to the story of Exodus. Let's pray. And so, Father, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Literally just opening up your word this morning and already right out the gates seeing that, God, you are a God of covenant. That what you said in the beginning, you will bring it to completion. That we get to see the grand narrative 
that we know how the story ends, that, that what you said to Adam and Eve, we see it completed in the book of Revelation. And this speaks of your faithfulness, that for many of us even here today, we can uh, trace uh, your fingerprints, the, your faithfulness throughout our lives. And so, Father, I, I pray that that right now in this very moment that you would just be with us, that we want to know that you are present, that you are near to us, that you hear our, our groanings and, and our challenges, you're aware of our circumstances. Would you lead us, Lord? Holy Spirit, would you lead us? Lead us to the Father's heart. For there is no better place to be. We love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.